Okay, so let me start just by thanking Katie and Ken and all the other organizers for um, inviting me to speak here and putting together this, this great program. Um, okay, week four, I'm guessing you must all be exhausted, right? Okay, I'll try and be gentle with you. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, explain to you some uh, basic facts about quantum field theory, many of which will be very old, and facts from the 1970s and, and early 1980s, but things that are sort of the classics of, uh, of quantum field theory that are still very relevant today. And I'm going to try and put these things in various modern contexts to do with e brains and ADS-C and T and things like this. So the things I'll be covering are things like uh, classical solitons, uh, the quantum dynamics of solitons, um, some beautiful ideas to do with geometry and quantum mechanics from the early 1980s, uh, things like Berry strings. Um, how to quantize supermodels in two dimensions and how they're related to the quantization of gauge theories in four dimensions. So, so just some pretty standard stuff on, uh, on quantum field theory that hopefully will be interesting uh, and useful. So let me give you a rough plan for the lectures. So I have five lectures this week. I should just warn you, I, I dislocated my shoulder about a month ago. Don't ever do that. It's so painful. So this is as high as I can reach, but hopefully as the week goes on, I'll, I'll, I'll increase up. Okay, so, so the plan is, today I'm going to tell you about Yang Mills instantons. And tomorrow, I'm going to tell you about Berry's phase and ADS-CFT. Then Wednesday's topic is vortices. And the topics of Thursday and Friday are both the quantum dynamics of vortices. Vortices, by vortices I mean strings in a four-dimensional gauge theory, something like cosmic strings. So this is vortices in uh, n equals two SUSY theories. And this is vortices in n equals one SUSY theories. And the basic uh, topics here are going to be explaining how, how you quantize sigma models in two dimensions and some relationship to, to gauge theory in four dimensions. Okay, so please ask lots of questions. Um, interrupt me as much as you like. Well, there's one further thing. I, I gave um, some Tassie lectures a couple of years ago, and these are very roughly based on them. Lecture one and lecture three um, are in those Tassie notes, and uh, lecture one is and put for you at the back, but the HEP TH number, if you want to look more at this, is uh, 0509216. So these are TASI lectures on solitons. So these lecture notes deal mostly with classical solitons, and uh, I decided that this time around I'll tell you more about their quantum dynamics, because that's where much more of the interest is. Okay, so let me start with. Instantons. Um, so let's take just a very, very simple theory to start with. Let's take pure SUN Yang Mills theory. The action is very simple. Usual Yang Mills action. Uh, just some conventions, uh, F mu mu is going to be uh, d mu a nu minus d mu a nu minus. So the usual field strength, but, but with an i sitting in there. Uh, the gauge field is going to be living in the Lie algebra, so t a are the generators of the Lie algebra. Um, and the Hermitian generators, that's why the I is sitting there. And finally, there's the, uh, the usual filling form on the Lie algebra. Which is why we have a two there instead of the four in the usual, in from Maxwell action. Okay, so the equations of motion. very familiar, it's just the covariant derivative of the field strength vanishes. And what instantons are, are solutions to these 
equations of motion that have finite action and live in Euclidean space rather than Minkowski space. Okay, so the, the reason they live in, in Euclidean space is because they typically have interpretations in terms of uh, tunneling events um, in, in quantum field theories. But for the purposes of this lecture, I'm mostly just going to tell you about some classical aspects of these solutions and also how uh, we understand them in terms of debris. Okay, so we look for for uh, solutions to the equation of motion in Euclidean space with finite action. Okay, so the first thing we're going to need if it has finite action is that as we approach infinity in R4, the field strength vanishes. Otherwise, you can see you're just going to pick up uh, uh, an infinite piece from, from the infinity of, uh, of R4. So we require, just by this finite action statement, that as R goes to infinity, F mu has to be zero, which means that A mu is pure gauge. As we hit the boundary, the gauge field has to be pure gauge. So G here is some element of the, the SUA group. But the key observation is that which element of the SUA group can depend where you are on the boundary. So G can depend on, uh, on X, which direction you hit the boundary. What this means is that just by the, the requirements of finite action, the space of all configurations that have finite action are classified by a map Is this a map from the S3 that lives at infinity into the gauge group? And that map is precisely this, this element G. So there's a mathematical classification of uh, maps from spheres into various other spaces. It goes by the name of homotopy theory. And um, through the eyes of homotopy theory, any two maps are considered equivalent if they can be continuously deformed into each other. Okay, so these maps are classified I have multiple theory. And two maps are said to be equivalent if they can be continuously <coughs> deformed into each other. And so the uh, maps we're interested in are from the three sphere into SUN, and that means we're interested in the third homotopy <coughs> group of SUN. And you can look this up in mathematics books, so I'll try and convince you shortly this is the case, and you find that it's Z. So all finite action configurations, just pure SUN theory, uh, come with a, an integer which labels them which is to do with uh, how, the, uh, how the gauge group at infinity changes as you move around this, this three sphere. So let me, let me just try and, um, and clarify this for you a little bit. Um, think of the simplest non-abelian gauge group, which is SU2. Now, SU2 is easy because SU2 is itself, as a group, uh, a three sphere. So when we're thinking about SU2, we're thinking about maps from a three sphere, which is the three sphere at spatial infinity, to another three sphere, which is 
is the gauge group SU2. Okay, so it's not too hard to convince yourself that those maps are classified by an integer which tells you how many times one of the three spheres winds around the other three spheres. So, for example, we could do this with circles first, where it's fairly simple. Suppose I have one circle here and another circle here, and I want to know all the possible maps from the first circle into the second. Well, there's an obvious one where I just take uh, all points on this circle and map it to a single point on the second circle. That's a map that has zero winding number. As I go around this circle once, I don't go around this circle at all. I just stick in a point. There's another obvious map where I take this circle and I just place it on top of the other circle, that has winding number one. When I go around this circle once, I go around this circle once. Now, it's obvious how you generalize. If I go around this circle once and this circle k times, that's a map that has winding number k. OK, so from circles to circles, it's obvious. From two spheres to two spheres, you can kind of picture it in your head. And mathematically, it's exactly the same. For n spheres to n spheres, you also get this same uh, uh, winding number. OK, so for SU2, it's pretty clear why these maps are labeled by an integer. For SUN, what you have to do is pick an SU2 subgroup in SUN, and then you map the three sphere at infinity into that, that SU2 subgroup. Now, you might worry that you could kind of slip off in the rest of the SUN subgroup. You know, SUN is much bigger than just a three sphere. What this statement here tells you is that that doesn't happen. But if you do an embedding in SU2, that doesn't happen. Yes? No, no, it's, it's still Z. So you can, you can move from one three sphere into another three sphere continuously. So if you have one SU2 subgroup and you kind of wrap around that, you can continuously deform that into another SU2 subgroup. So it, it's still Z. There's only one integer that, that, that labels this for SU2. OK, any other questions? OK, so we know that there's some integer uh, Z, which labels all of these solutions. So let me just give you, state for you what this, um, this integer is. We know it has to have something to do with these Gs that the gauge group hits asymptotically. And in fact, there's a very nice formula where if you're given a particular G at infinity, you can calculate the winding. And the formula is the following. OK, so given the asymptotic behavior of the gauge group, this is for just configurations, by the way. We haven't stipulated solutions yet, just configurations. You compute the following, and this tells you how many times the gauge group winds at infinity. OK, so this is precisely this integer. Now, if you want to go over these basics in more detail, there are these beautiful lectures by Coleman in his uh, Aspects of Symmetries book where you go through this step by step, firstly for the circle and computing examples for that, and so on and so on. Yeah? Is that the Dubai tree of the Dubai core of the Dubai tree of the Dubai I have no idea. Um, pi 4, the classifying space of SUN. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. When we want to generalize these forms very many lots of variations and we are getting that, we should look at the You have to look at, at pi two, pi four, depending on, on which, which dimension you're in or depending which the soliton is. And typically things just just change and you have to treat each case in in step. And in the third lecture I'll I'll talk about a situation where pi one is is the interesting object for, for vortices. OK, good. So, so the space of configuration splits up into these, um, uh, these sectors labeled by an integer. So the next thing we want to ask ourselves is, are there solutions that have uh, this particular winding at infinity? And a priori, it's, it's not at all clear uh, that there are. But let me give you an argument due to Bogomolny that can be used for <coughs> solitons in all, well, I, I was going to say all supersymmetric theories, but actually it's all supersymmetrizable. 
theorists. So many of the solitons, nearly all of the solitons you'll be interested in string theory, you can apply this same Bogomolny argument. So let me tell you what Bogomolny's argument is. Okay, Bogomolny has many, many spellings in the literature with various apostrophes in his name. Um, Nick Manton met Bogomolny and asked him, and he said he doesn't like any apostrophes. So apparently this is Bogomolny's preferred way of spelling. Okay, so what you do is you take the uh, Yang-Mills action. And you just rewrite it in the following way. So I've introduced here the uh, star f mu nu. And star f mu is the dual of f mu nu. Defined in the following way. Okay, so the star of f12 is f mu. Okay, so all I've done at the moment is, is rewrite this. If you multiply the if you square the star of f mu nu, the epsilon symbols cancel, and you get the same as if you square f mu nu. So this term squared plus this term squared gives back this. But then I get the cross terms, and all I've done here is cancelled off the cross terms. Now, Bogomolny's observation, which, like I said, works uh, in many situations. In fact, it's kind of trivial here, but it works in many other less trivial situations, is that this is a total square. So obviously, this is greater than zero which means that the action of any configuration has to be greater than this cross term. Now, we're in business if this cross term is somehow a conserved quantity, and in particular a topological quantity. And that is the case here. So if you write out f mu nu star f mu nu, you find that it's actually a total derivative. <laughs> Okay, so this term I've written here is just the integral of f star. Uh, that dropped out. Okay, so what we've seen is that the action of any configuration is always bounded by some characteristic of that configuration integrated over the, uh, the sphere at infinity. And in fact, if you plug in the asymptotic form of the gauge field into this total derivative, what you find, of course, is that it's exactly this integer k here, which we said labeled the configurations. Getting all the factors of <coughs> 2 and pi squared, right? For the e squared. So Bogomolny tells us that the action of any configuration, and I've called it inst because shortly this is going to be uh, saturated for the instant on, is necessarily greater than 8 pi squared over e squared multiplied by the modulus of this integer k. And now the plus minus sign, I've picked the right one, so this is a positive number, not a negative number. What's more, we get equality if and only if the 
field strength is either self-dual or anti-self-dual, where again, the plus minus sign you pick here is correlated with whether the integer k is positive or negative. Okay, so now Bogomoli's argument goes, goes as follows. Well, if any configuration with a particular topological charge is bounded by this number, if I can minimize the action in a given topological sector, that has to be a solution to the equation of motion. So if I can uh, minimize the action, meaning saturate this inequality, meaning find solutions to these equations, that's got to be a solution to the full equations of motion. And in this case, it's kind of trivial that it is. So the claim is that f equals star f solves with a plus or minus. <coughs> solves the equations of motion. And you can check, and it's completely trivial to check in this case, because the equation of motion is d mu f mu mu equals 0. But if the Bogomoli equations are satisfied, self-duality equations, that's equal to d mu of star f mu. But that's immediately guaranteed to be zero just by the Bianchi identity. OK, so what do we learn from Bogomoli's argument? We learn that if you can find solutions to these first order partial differential equations, you're guaranteed to have solutions to the second order differential equations, which you get from the equation of motion. Okay, now like I said, in this case, it's kind of trivial. Um, you can check immediately that f equals star f solves the equations of motion. But in many more other situations, more general situations, you can derive Bogomoli equations, first order equations of motion, where it wasn't at all obvious if you were just staring at the second order equations of motion that you could integrate them once in this way to get, to get first order ones. But this completing the square trick that we did here and then throwing away terms uh, is very useful. OK, any questions about Good, so now we've got the equations we want to solve. We've uh, got first order partial differential equations instead of second order partial differential equations, and we want to know if, if there's solutions to them. So for the next uh, 55 minutes, what I'm going to do is show you all the solutions to these equations. Okay, every single one you can write. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is give you the simplest solution to these equations. Actually, the simplest solution is, of course, a mu equals zero, which is just the vacuum solution or the pure gauge version thereof. So I'll give you the solution with winding number one. Then I'm going to take you through some of the properties of that solution. And then I'm going to tell you which of those properties generalize to um, well, the most general solution and some of the properties of the most general solution. And then I'm going to use D-brains to uh, show you how you can find every single solution that you want to have. So, an example <coughs> of a solution. So, the k equals 1 solution, that's winding number 1. in a Nashi 2 gauge group. Okay. And it's given by the following. So there's a whole bunch of notation here that I've introduced. Let me go through it bit by bit. These eaters. Okay, these are the Toft matrices. So these are three four by four 
real anti self dual matrices that satisfy the extra two count. And they're given by the following. Okay, there's, there's related matrices where you drop the bar and you change some of the, the minus signs around. The properties of these eta matrices is that they're anti-self-dual, meaning that <coughs> eta is equal to minus star eta. Okay? If you don't have the bar, they're self-dual, meaning eta is equal to star eta. Okay, so there's a few properties of this solution that I want to tell you about. Firstly, it looks singular. When this x here, so this x is the coordinate on the R4 of previous space time. When this x here is equal to the capital X, obviously this whole thing diverges. That's not something we should be worried about. It turns out that's, um, that's a gauge artifact. It's rather like a coordinate singularity in, in general relativity. If you compute something physical, like, for example, the trace of f mu nu, f mu nu, you'll find that everything is nice and smooth and nothing diverges at that point. There's another version of this solution where the singularity isn't there, it's just a little more complicated to write down. Okay, so the thing I want to stress about this solution is that it's not unique. I've got a bunch of parameters in this solution. So the solution has eight parameters. Oh, they're usually called in the context of solutions um, in soliton physics, collective coordinates. <laughs> okay, so what are these parameters? There's four translations. So these are just these sort of center of mass coordinates. Center of action is probably a, a better name, but this is a field configuration which is localized in Euclidean space and time. The capital X equals Okay, so this parameter rho that sits in front of everything, this is a scale size. So it's not obvious from this, but if you rescale uh, little x to little x over rho, then um, the whole thing just uh, shifts up by uh, scale transformation. So the reason for this is the, the original classical Yang-Mills action is conformally invariant, which means that if I find a solution that's this big, I hit it with a dilatation and I get a solution that's this big, it's still got to be a solution. Okay, so I've got one scale size rho. And finally, I have three orientational modes. <coughs> okay, so this G here is an arbitrary member of SU2. It doesn't depend on X. This is a global uh, gauge rotation. And it just tells me how this Yang Mills instanton is sitting inside, uh, inside the SU2 thing. Okay, so uh, a cute little exercise. is to show that if you compute the field strength from this, uh, this gauge potential, it's equal to FPU is equal to star FPU. You know, there's a cute little uh, minus sign flip that happens here. The eta symbols that we put in here are anti-self-dual, meaning that eta is equal to minus star eta. But that anti-self-duality becomes a self-duality of, of the, uh, the gauge field. And vice versa, if I was to put uh, eta's in here without the bar, I get an anti-self-dual gauge field. Quite cute. Uh, then you can also show that the action of this instanton 
is equal to eight pi squared over e squared, meaning it has winding number one. Alternatively, you could compute the winding number uh, directly, but I think that's easier in the, uh, the non-singular gauge, so that's, that's probably the best way to do it. Oh, so everything is raised with, um, or because I'm in Euclidean space, okay. there's not a Minkowski metric, so everything is raised with plus one. <laughs> Sorry, it's a bit, bit sloppy. Yeah. Okay, so the k equals one solution in SU2 had uh, eight parameters. What about the arbitrary k solution in SUN? So let me first tell you about the k equals one solution in SUN. Said we could always take the SU2 solution and just embed it in a, in a subgroup of SUN. So, for example, I could take the 2 by 2 matrix in the upper left hand corner and simply put that A mu nu in there, and that's guaranteed to be a solution to the SUN equation of motion. But of course, it's not the most general solution. I could always try and embed it with other SU2 subgroups. So what I'm going to get by doing this is I'm still going to have the scale size and the translation, but I'm going to get more orientational modes telling me where this SU2 instanton is sitting inside SUN. So how many more? Well, what I should look at is how I can act on this with the SUN to sort of move it into the part of the matrix. So what I can do is I can act on this with the gauge root SUN. But then there's a stabilizer I've got to divide out by that's just not going to agree. And that stabilizer is anything that just hits this zero here. Divided by the things that just hit that, because I've already included them as the G in the solution. But then I should uh, I should make sure that, that the stabilizer is in the SUN group. So what I've done is use this notation where the S sits outside. So that is, you project out the diagonal U1 of that and U1 of that, because that's not an SUN notation. Okay, so if I want to know the number of possible orientational modes of this, this object, I just count the dimension of this, uh, this coset space. There's n squared minus 1 is the dimension of SUN, minus the dimension of the stabilizing group, and I find that there's 4n minus 8 extra orientational modes that tell me how this SU2 instant can sit in, in SUN. Um, yeah? Could you explain that? What is the rule of the Oh, good. So I, I put the instant on up here in the top left hand corner. And the question I want to ask is uh, what's the space of all possible embeddings? Or what, what, in particular, how many parameters label the space of all possible embeddings? Okay, so how do I get other embeddings? I take that SU2 and I rotate it using SUN into some other part of, of the gauge. So that's what this object does. But then much of this object, most of it in fact, doesn't do anything at all. For example, if I take an SUN rotation that acts on the zero, it doesn't change this, this solution. If I take an SU2 rotation that acts here, it's the same thing I already counted. It's the G that sits over there, so I don't want to include that either. And then there's a U1 which rotates this and rotates this in the opposite way. So there's, that's another way of writing this as SUN minus 2 times SU2 times U1. It's um yeah okay so so, so this this thing here is S U N minus two times S U two times U one. 
And the SL side is saying that you project out one of these two U1s, and the one you project out is the diagonal. Okay, so what we learn is that the one instanton in SUN has 4n minus 8, but then plus the 8 we already started with, so it has 4n collective coordinates. Okay, so that's 4n parameters for a single instanton in SUN. Four of them are translations, one of them is scale size, and then the 4n minus 4 can be how it's embedded in the game. I, I should point out something here. You know, you're, you're told um, as soon as you start learning about gauge theories that gauge symmetries aren't symmetries at all, they're redundancies of the system. And if I take two configurations that are related by a gauge transformation, I shouldn't think of them as physically different, I should think of them as really exactly the same object. And yet here I'm counting gauge rotations, how this guy sits in, in the SUN gauge group, as being real physical parameters of the, of the solution. So there's a small subtlety here, which is that every gauge group has a global part, which is essentially the part of the gauge transformations that don't die off at infinity. And that global part is really a physical transformation, not a, not a redundancy of the system. So, for example, it's that physical part that means that you know, the conservation of electric charge happens in, in Q and D, okay, by Noether's law. That happens for global symmetries. Noether's law applies to global symmetries, and it's the global part of the U1 of, of E and M that applies to that, that current. So the same thing's happening here. We're counting global parts of gauge symmetries as physical parameters. Okay. So finally, I want to tell you, what about arbitrary K in arbitrary SUN? A charge K instanton in SUN. So how many parameters does this, this depend on? So here we can't just write down the most general solution and count them, which is what I've done just here. We have to do something a little more subtle. And what we do is we use index theorems. Okay, so the things like the Atiyah-Singer index theorem are designed to answer precisely this kind of question. So let me just give you a few details about, about how that works. So the first thing we do is we linearize our equations. So let's take some solution A mu consider some small infinitesimal uh, change to that solution. Okay, so this is the linearized form of the uh, self-dual equation. Notice it depends on the configuration I start with because it sits in this covariant derivative here and here. Okay, so the game we're playing is the following. We take a solution and suppose this solution has uh, m parameters and we want to figure out m. Then what we're doing is we're saying let's change this solution a little bit and ask uh, when that deformed solution uh, satisfies the linearized version of the equation. So when moving it in that direction a little bit, it's going, going to still solve the f equals star f equations. Except there's a subtlety here, because we know that if we add any infinitesimal gauge transformation to this, it's bound to still satisfy these linearized equations. So we've got to worry about 
gauge transformation. In other words, we need some gauge fixing condition. Okay, so any gauge transformation is guaranteed to satisfy these linearized self-duality equations. So what we do is the following. We write hmm, I'll just say this. So suppose the solution we start with depends on some number of parameters, and we want to figure out how many, how many of these are. So what we do is we define the zero modes. Okay, so this is the part that's changing the configuration in the direction of the solution just a little bit and is guaranteed to satisfy the linearized equations precisely because x alpha was a parameter of the solution. And this is a gauge transformation that you add that's also guaranteed to solve uh, the linearized equations precisely because it's a gauge transformation. We need to find a way to determine this. I, we need some gauge fixing condition. So what we do is we choose gauge transformation such that this this uh, change of the field is orthogonal to all gauge transformations. So what does that mean? that we want to have zero mode. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have called this alpha. This is something rather different. Let me call that beta. We want our zero mode to be orthogonal to all gauge transformations, which means that the overlap integrated over four spaces vanishes. So integrating by parts, it tells us we should require the following constraint on our zero modes. OK, so including the subtlety of gauge transformations, we find there's two equations we want to solve. We want to find all small fluctuations delta a mu around the background of a solution, where the solution sits in here, that satisfies both the gauge fixing condition and the linearized equations. So we have two equations that we want to satisfy. And what we want to do is count the number of solutions to these two equations, and that's going to tell us how many parameters our instanton depends on. Okay, so this is exactly what the Atiyah Singer index theorem does for us. And I'm not going to run through it, although it's not it'll take like 15 minutes. It's not, not too hard, but I just I won't do it now. And I'll just give you the answer. So Atiyah Singer Number of zero modes, which means the number of solutions to those equations, is equal to the number of collected coordinates is equal to four times k times n. Yes, 
yes, that, that, that's right. In the, in the Lee algebra. Yeah, it's infinitesimal. States. This is uh, this is the natural inner product of functions. It's just like in quantum mechanics. You just take the inner product of two wave functions, you side size star integrate over. Okay, so if we have an SUN gauge group with a charge K, I should say this is really mod K here. Um, a charge K instanton, the most general solution has four times K times N parameters. Okay, so, so now we know the answer to that question. There's a number of ways we could proceed. We could just try and write down the most general solution. And um, if I have time, I'm going to do it but in a rather implicit way. It, it turns out that explicitly the most general solution uh, isn't known. So in the late 1970s, um, smart people started writing down the most general solutions they could think of. So there's a, a lovely ansatz by Toft. I think he gets five times. Sorry, that, that's not right. He get sorry for SU two. Toft gets five times k. So the most general for SU two should be eight k. Toft gets five k. What he misses are the relative orientations of, uh, of the different. I should say there's a natural interpretation for this. We have k instantons. So the natural interpretation is that each of them has four n parameters: scale, size, position an orientation. It turns out that's, um, that's certainly true when the instantons are far separated. As they get closer together, these solutions, you know, these are complicated solutions to uh, complicated differential equations, and, and they sort of lose their, uh, their individuality as they get closer together. They merge together. So when the instantons are sitting on top of each other, you can't really give this interpretation of, well, this one has that position, this one has that position. It kind of all, all blends together. But roughly speaking, you should think of this as uh, four positions for each, a scale size for each, and an orientation. Okay, so Toft wrote, wrote down a nice solution. There's another solution by Jakeev, Noel, and Revy. Uh, and then Witten wrote down um, uh, a really impressive ansatz to do with mixing the symmetries of various ways. I have a feeling this is like 1976 or 1977. I have a feeling this was the first really, really clever thing that, that Witten did. I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's what really made people sort of take notice of him. And I'm sure he was known before, but so that really uh, made people stand up and think, I think. Okay, so we could do that, but in fact, you know, finding these solutions isn't really um, what it's about. There's something that's much more interesting than the solutions, and that's uh, the moduli space of solutions. So, so let me uh, tell you about the moduli space. Okay, so the moduli space is the space of all solutions. And I'm going to call it I K subscript A. And different people call it different things. The I here stands for instanton. K is the winding number of the instanton, and N is. So what do we know about this? Well, we know what we've just computed, the dimension of this space is equal to 4 times k times n. So the parameters of the solution our coordinates on the space. The zero modes of the solution. You think of as tangent vectors.
on IKN. And the nicest thing is that these zero modes that we have define a natural metric on this space. The metric is the following. You take the overlap of two zero modes, one with respect to changing your coordinate x alpha, and one with respect to changing your coordinate x beta. You can track the a mu's together, you integrate over all of space. And you chose. Okay, so the most explicit thing we could have is the full solution, which is a solution in the four dimensional space. However, given, suppose we know all solutions, we can write down this metric on some four times k times n dimensional space. It turns out that for nearly all applications of instantons in quantum field theories or D brains or string theory, this is really the object that you need to know. You don't really need to know the solutions usually. What you really need to know is, is this metric here. What's more, this metric is, is something which very often you can get, even if you don't know the explicit solution. So there are shortcuts to getting this metric where you don't have to figure out the most general solution, differentiate with respect to the parameter, take the overlap, do the integration. You can do shortcuts to get to, to this metric. OK, so it's this metric here that's really crucial in um, understanding uh, instanton physics, in, uh, certainly in supersymmetric gauge theories, has lots of nice properties. Um, the space is a multiple of four, and uh, this metric is something called hyperkähler. So for those of you who, who don't know, a Kähler manifold is complex, essentially. Every way you can, you can piece together um, you know, complex coordinates in such a way that's consistent with a whole manifold. Hyperkähler is, very roughly speaking, quaternionic. There's also something called a quaternionic manifold, so it's not, it's not quite true. But basically, everywhere on the manifold, you can group together coordinates in, in groups of four. Rather than really being, well, the correct statement is there's three complex structures which, uh, which satisfy the SU2 or the quaternion uh, relations between them. OK, so it's hyper -cave. Um Yeah, there's lots, lots more things I could, I could say here, including giving you examples. In the notes I've given you, I, I show you how to compute the metric explicitly for that single instant on an SU2. Um, but I, I'll, I'll let you go over that if, if you're interested. Instead, what I'd like to do in the last uh, 25 minutes is uh, explain to you how we can use D-brains to get to this metric and find the explicit solutions to, to these equations. Um, I should say that uh, this isn't something that first came out of string theory. What I'm going to tell you is called the ADHM construction. So ADH and M are Atia, Drinfeld, Hitchin, and Manin. And this is um, a paper that's about two and a half pages long from 1977. And it's, it's really uh, unbelievably con concise. They use twister methods um, to, to understand what I'm about to explain to you. But it's one of these ideas um, that happens a lot in string theory, where, where really beautiful mathematics just fits in absolutely perfectly into Debrit. And so what I'll tell you now is how you can understand this just by understanding uh, the dynamics of Debrit. OK, so are there any questions about what I've done so far before I jump up to 10 dimensions? All happy? OK. So David Kutusov gave you some lectures on D-brains already, right? Basic facts about the UN gauge theories living on this, this planet. Yeah, okay. Okay, good. Um, so this is the ADHM construction. Via brains. And this is... The D-brain interpretation of this came very quickly after Polchinski's discovery of D-brains. I think it's around 95 or 96, and it's by Mike Douglas. OK, so let me firstly um, do, do a bit of dimension hopping. What I've told you so far are finite action solutions in a 3 plus 1 dimensional gauge theory. 
Now, I could take those solutions trivially and lift them up to a 4 plus 1 dimensional gauge theory, but they wouldn't be finite action anymore because they'd persist in, in the time direction. So now these would be finite energy solutions in a 4 plus 1 dimensional gauge theory. In other words, these same solutions to f equals star f look like particle objects in a 4 plus 1 dimensional gauge theory. Okay, I just take the same solution, call the x mu here the spatial coordinates of the 4 plus 1 dimensions, and let everything persist in time. Right? Sorry? Basically, you Euclidean. So they're Euclidean, but only because it's the spatial part of 4 plus 1. The 4 plus 1 will now be Minkowski, but you'll embed these solutions in the, the four obviously Euclidean spatial directions of 4 plus 1. Okay, so we'll, we'll look at... At instantons, at particles, d equals 4 plus 1, and it'll be super young mills just because I'm dealing with, with d brains. And the setup I'm going to look at is a bunch of b4 brains. So these are supposed to all be coincident together. I'm going to take n of them, and I'm going to just put them in the direction 1, 2, 3, 4, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And then here, I'm going to consider a bunch of d0 brains. <coughs> that are floating around in the background of these d4 brains. Okay, so let's firstly view this whole thing from the perspective of the D4 brains, and for now, I'll just forget that I put zeros there at all. So the D4 brain theory is UN uh, gauge theory in D equals four plus one dimensions, sixteen supercharges, you know, the usual, usual thing. But there's this cute little coupling that sits in the D4 brain, D brain action, uh, which is a Ramond Ramond coupling. It's integrated over the D4 brain world volume. And it's the F wedge F that lives on the D4 brain, but wedged with uh, C1. That's the Ramond Ramond 1 form uh, potential that sits in type 2 H trigger theory. So, are you familiar with these Ramond Ramond couplings? Anybody not familiar with these Ramond Ramond couplings? Okay, I'll talk to you after. <laughs> okay, so what's the, what's the uh, significance of this? Suppose that we actually have a configuration which is an instant on sitting inside here. So <laughs> suppose that the trace over R4, that's the spatial R4, of F wedge F <laughs> is equal to 8 pi squared K over G squared, where K is the number of instantons that, that we've put in there. Then when we work out the equation of motion for C1, remember we've got these kinetic terms up in 10 dimensions, uh, dc1 wedge uh, dc1. Uh, we have to divide by, or differentiate with respect to a C1, which means that in the equation of motion for C1, we're going to get something like um, the derivative of the field strength in 10 dimensions associated to C1 equals, and then there's a source on the right-hand side of that equation. There's an f wedge f, which integrates to be something like k. So what this tells us is that an instanton sitting inside the D4 brains is a source for the C1. But the object that's charged under the C1 in 10-dimensional string theory is precisely the zero brain. Okay. So this ramon ramon coupling tells us that an instanton inside the four brain carries the same charge as the D0 brain. Now, you also know the mass of this instanton. It's 8 pi squared over G squared. We can... Uh, translate this into L streams and G streams in the usual fashion, and you find that the mass of the instanton is exactly the same as the mass of the D0. So what we've got is the situation where 
an instanton inside the D4 brain carries uh, the same charge and the same mass as a D0 brain. So the natural uh, conjecture is that it really is uh, a D0 brain. So, so the instanton in the D4 brain is equal to a D0 brain, which somehow has trapped itself inside the D4 brain. No, no. So, so remember, we have four times k times n parameters. So uh, that means there's four n parameters for each instanton. And one of those parameters is telling you where they sit in, in, in space. So each one is free to move quite happily uh, in the four-dimensional space. And do they have any kind of interaction between them? Oh, yes, yes. So, so actually, there's, I, I wasn't going to mention this because of lack of time. But as you asked, I, I will. I wrote down this. this um, on the instanton moduli space, okay? So you could ask the following. In four, you can't ask this in four dimensions, you can ask this in five dimensions because you have time going on now. Let me take two instantons here and here, or k instantons dotted around, and give the field configurations a bit of a kick. So now things start moving towards each other, they might start changing in size, their orientation might change. The way you have to figure this out is you go to the full second order differential equations, including time, the four plus one dimensional gauge group, see how the configuration evolves. That's a very hard thing to do. However, this metric that I wrote down on these is such that for very slow motion, geodesics of this metric precisely track the motion of the, uh, the five dimensional super That's another nice thing about metric. That, that, some, that was Nick Manson's uh, bigger insight in to do with monopoles rather than instantons in, in the early 80s. Okay, are there any other, other questions? Okay. Okay, so we know these D0 brains are instantons. So the trick now is to change our perspective completely and ask what does all this look like from the perspective of, of the D0 brains? How on earth do they see all that? So what is What is the D0 brain theory? Well, we know that it's D equals 0 plus 1, 16 supercharge. I'm going to call this 8 comma 8 for various reasons. Um, UK gauge theory. OK, so what this means is you take the, the maximally supersymmetric super young mills in 10 dimensions and you dimension reduce it down to quantum mechanics. This is, uh, is the, the theory of matrix theory. People remember this from ancient history. Um, OK, so this is the theory that you get by looking at the 0, 0 strings. OK, pretend that you four brain down there, quantize the strings that stretch between the 0 brains, ignore these for now. This is what you get. UK gauge theory describing particles moving in, in 10 dimensions the, the scalar fields, well, the bosonic fields, are single gauge potential, A0, because we're quantum mechanics. And then nine scalar fields, which I'm splitting up into a four and a five, I'm anticipating the fact that the D4 brains are going to kick in soon. So the w Y direction is parallel to the D4s, and the X direction is perpendicular to the, to the D4s. Okay. So each of these fields is a, is a UK adjoint valued object, real object. And just for use later, I'm going to split the ones that are um, parallel to the D4 into two complex objects. which we call W and Z.
Okay, so that would be the theory of D0 grains in flat space. How do they know about the D4? Well, the way they know about the D4s in string theory is you have zero four strings, which you have to quantize and look at the lowest states of these zero four strings. So it's, it's a standard problem in Polchinski. And so the presence of the D4 grains. So for those of you who, who have gone through this, remember that the DP, DP plus four system is very special because it preserves uh, one quarter of supersymmetry. Um, what that means is the theory I'm going to write down has eight supercharges instead of, instead of 16. Um, presence of the D4 brains gives rise to hypermultiplets. the D0 world volume. <laughs> okay, so for those of you who, who don't know what a hypermultiplet is, this is the representation of n equals 2 supersymmetry in four dimensions, the series with eight supercharges. It contains four real scalar fields and a bunch of fermions. For the purpose is now I'm just going to write down the scalar fields. So this has two complex scalar fields. Okay, so there's two complex scalar fields, one that I call phi, one that I call phi tilde, and each carries two indices. One of them goes from 1 to k, reflecting the zero grain that the string ends on, and the other one goes from 1 to n, reflecting the four grain that the string ends on. Okay, so this guy is in the, it's in the k n-bar representation of the UK gauge theory on the D4 brain, on the D0s, and the UN on the D4. And this guy is in the, in the conjugate representation. Okay, so now we have a bunch of scalar fields. We have the, uh, the the nine adjoint UK value scalars from the zero zero strings and these objects which are fundamental in the UK gauge group. And uh, the full theory of the D0s is dictated completely by supersymmetry. There's really very little you can, you can play with. And in particular, the scalar potential for these fields is also dictated by supersymmetry. So let me tell you what the scalar potential is on the D0s. I'm going to be a little schematic. But there's, um, this would be the scalar potential just on the D0 brains. These are just the usual commutator terms between scalars. There'd be a commutator term between the different Y guys. The Ys are the ones parallel to the D4. I'll write those down shortly. Then there's a couple of terms that look like the following. the relevance of these shortly. And then there's the two very important terms that are called D terms, or sometimes D and F terms. Actually, Kalosh calls them P terms, so we've got all sorts of possibilities.
Okay, so this is the potential. It looks complicated, but actually it's, it's, it's not too bad. Let me explain what everything means. And we'll see what's going on. So what we're interested in are the zeros of this potential. So classically, this means, what can I do to the d zero grains that doesn't raise their energy at all? So we're after solutions v equals zero here. And there's two different class of solutions uh, to setting this scalar potential equals zero that go by the name of the Coulomb branch and the Higgs branch. So let me explain what's meant by Coulomb branch and what's meant by Higgs branch and what are the solutions to v equals zero here. Okay, so solutions... <coughs> Look for solutions to v equals zero. And like I said, there's two different possibilities. So one is, let's set the phi's and the phi tildes to zero. Remember, the phi's and the phi tildes were telling us about the interactions between the d4s and the d0s. They came from, from those strings. OK, so let's do that. Uh, we don't have to worry about these terms as soon as we set them to zero. And when phi and phi tilde go to zero here, what we get are traces of z and w squared and v and z bar and w and w bar squared. z and w were the y's though, they were just complexified y coordinates. So in fact, this and this just add with this to give us the uh, commutator x squared, commutator xy squared, commutator y squared, and that's the usual d0 theorem. So when phi and phi tilde are zero, xm and y mu uh, should be diagonal. Okay, by making them diagonal, that's how you make commutators match, all mutually diagonal. So what's this telling us? Well, this is telling us that if you neglect the d4 brains, the d0 brains are free to move wherever you like. The components of the diagonal components of these adjoint scalars just tell us the positions of the d0s. They can move in and out. They can go into the d4 brain. They can move away from the d4 brain. At tree level, they're not seeing the presence of the d4 brain at all. It's actually only when you integrate out the hypermultiplexer one loop that the d4 brain's back react from this space. So this is the motion of d0 brains. in R9, and this is called the Coulomb branch, and it's called the Coulomb branch because the U1, the UK gauge theory on the D0s is broken to a bunch of U1s, which means that any charged particle feels a Coulomb interaction. It's a bit of a dumb name, actually, for quantum mechanics. It makes more sense in higher theories. Okay, let me just take two or three more minutes and tell you what the Higgs branch is and how that's related to these things. So the other solution is where you set all the xms equal zero. Now the xms are the positions of the d0s are this way. So when xm is equal to zero, the d0s are sitting right on uh, on the d4. In fact, now you see the importance of these objects here. When xm is non-zero, it's giving a mass to the phi's and the phi tildes. But that mass is precisely the energy of a stretched string from the d0s to the d4. So xm equals zero is the d0 sitting on the d4. These terms vanish, these terms vanish, and all we're left with are these two, two terms here. So what we're left with is So each of these is a k by k matrix equation. So the Higgs branch is defined to be the space of all phi's, phi tilde's, z and w's subject to these equations. Now each is a k by k matrix equation, but this one's real and this one's complex. This is a d term and this is an x term. So the Higgs branch is equal to xm equals zero, 
with v equals zero, which is these equations here. But now there's a caveat, which is that we should divide out by things that are related by a UK gauge transformation. Okay? If we can rotate the phi's or the z's amongst themselves by a UK gauge transformation, that's the same configuration. So let's just count the dimensions of the Higgs branch. The dimension of M Higgs is equal to 4 times k times n. These are the two complex scalars phi and phi tilde. Two complexes, the four, uh, and they're both in, they both have a k and an n index. Plus 4k squared, this is the z and the w, or the y mu, directions parallel to the d4s. But then we've got to impose the constraints. There's a, there's a k squared from here, which is the d term. There's a 2k squared from there, because it's complex. It's the f term. And then you should divide out by uk gauge transformations. And the dimension of the Higgs branch is 4 times k times n, which is something that we saw already. So final thing I want to tell you is that the Higgs branch of this zero dimensional gauge theory, which is four times k times n dimensional, is the same as the moduli space of Yang Mills. Okay, so what's happening? These D zero grains are moving to here, and suddenly there's new ways that they can grow and evolve. They can uh, start to spread in the d4s, which corresponds to turning on the phi and the phi tilde at the zero four strings. And there they have the interpretation of instantons sitting inside the d4. Now, the real beauty of this whole ADHM construction is two things. Firstly, the gauge theory defined the natural metric on the Higgs branch. That's precisely this metric I told you about from the instanton moduli space. Secondly, there's a construction which obviously I'm not going to have time to go into, which tells you that given some phi's and phi tildes and z's and w's, how you construct precisely the solution that corresponds to that. And the amazing thing about this ADHM construction is you don't have to satisfy these first order differential equations, f equals star f. You only have to solve these much simpler algebraic equations between uh, phi's and z's and w's. Okay, I'm sorry that I went over by five minutes, but I'll finish there. Thanks.